why it's so important to get into real estate. And if not real estate, some other asset. The, the main reason why is because I'm sure you have enough money to buy a house, probably have that money sitting in a bank account somewhere. But if your money is sitting in a bank account, you're actually devaluing the money, right? So what happens when you basically print money, just like the Fed is doing right now, year after year? We know what we're doing because you, you can go to the Fed website and you can see they could be talking, tapering what they're doing right now. They're saying they're going to taper, but they're not tapering. They're just printing more and more money. Right? So when you have a deflationary event such as COVID, tell people they can't leave their house, tell people they, they can work from home and we're going to send you money, and you put more money into the system, what happens to real estate? People go buy houses. When they buy those houses, the property value goes up. Right? So understand what's happening. If you have cash, if you're holding on to cash, you're losing money. Whereas if you have real estate, the, there's more and more people looking to buy houses, the value of the real estate goes up. Not only does the value of the real estate goes up, but everyone on here own, is an owner, right? So every single year, rents go up. I had a property that I was charging a tenant $1,500 in rent. Today, because it's close to New York City, I'm getting $4,500 in rent in the space of like 10 years, but I've raised the rent to what the market is offering. Attention coaches, consultants, course creators. If you get paid based off your knowledge, I'm gonna tell you something very, very important, okay? What if I could teach you how to make an extra five to six figures every single month using simple Facebook and Instagram ads, all right? Let me tell you about my boy. He got the paid ad playbook. Listen, this paid ad playbook is gonna give it to you for free, first off. Markwell Russell, one of the most genuine people I've ever met, he's created over $500 million in client revenue using the paid ad playbook strategy, all right? So listen, go to socialproofgift.com or text PROOF to 904 447 Five two seven four. If you want to get 50 to 100 new client leads every day that actually convert, you need to go to socialproofgift.com or text PROOF to 904-447-5274. And he's going to give you a bonus video that helps you with a strategy to customize your particular strategy for your particular business. I Again, socialproofgift.com, text PROOF to 904-447-5274. Let's get into the episode. All right, welcome to another edition of the Social Proof Podcast, the episode of Social Proof 7. All right, come on, come on, come on, five, walk with me, walk with me. <laughs> okay, listen, we are here for the Social Proof 7 uh, edition. Y'all know we, uh, we just try to engage in um, amazing conversations. A lot of the podcasts we do is me talking to one person, and we kind of get to know their story, but um, on this session, we're trying to attack a topic. And this is a very, very selfish episode for me because I'm looking to build my real estate portfolio. So there was no other way I can get you all in one building to teach me how to build wealth. So give our guests a round of applause for being here. Um, I didn't want to uh, include anyone that was doing real estate on a small level. And small is uh, relative, right? Nothing wrong with people who do fix and flips. Nothing wrong with people who do uh, wholesaling. Nothing wrong with me. I got three doors. I got three doors, right, Terrica? She got me three doors. So uh, I got three doors. Um, so I'm the only person up here that's like, that's like infancy level. Um, but how many people this year you plan on getting into your first investment property? Let me see it. First investment property this year. Good. Give them a round of applause. How many people are already current investors and you have you have a few doors in your portfolio? Hands up, hands up. Give them a round of applause. Good, good, good. Um, anybody in the commercial space, commercial real estate? You own commercial real estate just yet? Okay. I'll give them a round of applause. Um, what we would like for what we like to happen is next year we have the same conversation and all hands go up. Because us as a community, we need to build wealth. And uh, I believe uh, most wealthy people, well, pretty much every wealthy person I've ever met has some sort of real estate portfolio. So we're gonna introduce our guests and I would love to hear, uh, you know, kind of what's your name, what market you uh, you live in, I suppose, because you guys invest in uh, all over. 
But uh, your name, uh, where you live, and uh, a little bit about, about your portfolio. You want to start, Jamisa? Me? Yeah, let's start with Jamisa. Ladies first. Hi, everybody. So I am Dr. Jamisa Bennett. I have a PhD in business management and real estate. 28 years old. I have 28 properties, one of them being a hotel. Um, but the best yeah, oh, we part... Oh, right there. <laughs> So you get one every year, you just get another keep up with your age? Now. Well, so what ended up happening was my first year buying real estate, I bought nine houses. And then I was house rich and cash poor, so I started to play Monopoly. And then I ended up with a bunch of properties that I purchased that needed to be rehabbed. So I had to learn how to manage money as I was investing. And because I do everything debt free, it takes me some time to... Oh, so it might be five properties being purchased in one month, and then it might be five months I didn't purchase another property. It just depends on what needs to be fixed in what order so that I can sustain the rest of the portfolio. I forgot mad questions. Okay. Give a round of applause. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mr. Baker, let's start there. Let's go there. Yeah, so I'm uh, A. Donahue Baker. I am a CPA as well. I'm also a CEO and co-founder of a fintech bank called Money Avenue. Uh, I currently own over 500 units, but my specialty is multi-family apartment housing. It has allowed me to retire from corporate America. It has allowed me to create generational wealth for my family. I started with smaller units, like my very first one was right here in Atlanta. It was a uh, duplex. I lived in one side, rented out the other, made it a goal to double the number of units I owned every single year. And uh, that's where I am, and that's how I got into apartment complexes. Yep. I love it. Yeah. Love it and use the bank, like literally have a bank, like a bank where people can get a debit card, checking account, savings. Absolutely. So one of the things that I hope that we could touch on it is really about building wealth. Most people see a bank as taking money out of your pocket. My bank puts money in your pocket. How we do it is really innovative, right? So for those of, of you that have anybody ever heard about the metaverse or crypto, it's so important that we're in front of movements before they happen, because once it becomes widely available, it's hard to get in. Most people look at their iPhone and they say, well, you know, Apple is a huge company, but if you invested in the first iPhone, you'd be a multimillionaire by now. But that first iPhone had no camera on it. It really wasn't the best technology available. And real estate right now is going through a lot of changes. One of them is the metaverse, taking real real estate, and, and digitizing it, it's gonna have value. And if you're not tapping into that value, you're gonna miss out. So hopefully we can talk about that a little bit later on as well, but it's so interesting space. It's gonna create lots of millionaires and billionaires at an early age. And I'll talk further on how everyone can be a part of that movement. Questions. Let's give them a <laughs> <pause>. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna skip one aside. Terika, you, like, cause you were telling me about some you got some metaverse land or something like that. Okay, go ahead. Introduce yourself. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, my name is Tara Kalin Smith. I'm a real estate developer. I have over 400 passive doors, along with four mixed-use communities that consist of 200 single-family homes and apartment complexes and um, retail, commercial retail as well. Good. Can you tell me about the the, the digital real estate you got? Did you? Yes. Is this something you got it already? Or <laughs> yes. So um, I partnered with um, a good friend who has worked with Marvel and Disney in regards to um, creating their own personal space in Metaverse. And so we are launching our own private Metaverse where we are the owners of it. And so I'm super excited. We have real estate for sale. I love it. And the only black female developer in the whole state of Louisiana, yes? Real estate developer. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, Eddie, talk, hold on, I gotta tell y'all real quick. So <laughs> I just asked Eddie, like, I was like, because he lives in Atlanta, he lives in Atlanta, and you got a bunch of real estate in Atlanta. And I was telling him I, I want a building like this, and he's like, I don't, I don't know how you gonna get that for me. I said, Well, you got some, right? He's like, It's like asking a doctor, Do y'all know where I can find some masks? He's like, Yo, I, he said, I don't know. Like, it's just I got a bigger. It's a, it's a higher level, right? So, Eddie, go on and introduce yourself, man, because I felt real small. No. Just like, go. <laughs> <laughs> Again, thanks for having me here. Um, my name is Eddie Benoit. I'm the founder and the CEO of the Benoit Group. We're a commercial real estate development company. 
and um, we own, develop, and manage our own property throughout the Southeast and in the Midwest. We have close to about 5,000 units under development and ownership management. So um, that's pretty much, you know, all oh, awesome. amazing. <laughs> when did you get your first though like we're at 5,000 a day but and the 5,000 really represents where we are today over since 2010 when I bought my partners out so I had a previous partnership with um, some other guys that we started back in 2002 and uh, the the recession was pretty tough pretty brutal I presided over the development company and it made sense in 2010 for us to part ways, it was amicable. So everything we had developed prior to then, which had allowed us to grow a company, a pretty sizable company, of close to 1,200 employees, um, it was time you know, for us to sunset that relationship and I created the Benoit Group in 2010. So we're, next month will be 12 years since that separation took place. So those 5,000 units are representative of what's taking place over that period of time. I don't know if that has any relevance. Give a round of applause. Wait a <laughs> <laughs> you know, I got a question. Uh, Doug. Yep, so, okay. my name, so my name is Doug Dept. I live in the Philadelphia area, just under 100 units. I don't like the scoreboard watch and everything, but uh, I've been retired for about three and a half years of corporate America, so I was literally on track to hug the cubicle to 67 and a half. But thankfully, I was introduced to real estate, and I bought my first property in Newark, Delaware, where I actually lived in the garage, rented out every single room in that garage, and sacrificed and, and saved up as much money as possible to buy the next property. And it just kept elevating and elevating and elevating, became my own general contractor, uh, own property management company, and just scaled up that way. Almost 100 doors in three and a half years. No, no, no. I've been in the game of real estate for over 11 years. Yep, so ever since living in the garage. Oh, you've been free, you've been out of your job. Okay, right, I had gotcha, that freedom, gotcha. of, freedom of mobility for three and a half years. Gotcha, yep, gotcha. and it's still elevating. Are you always looking for properties? Like Always, literally, actually on Thursday, my buddy called me up on Wednesday, said, hey, let's come down to Atlanta. We're gonna be looking at a thousand doors. So we looked at a 700 unit, a 331 unit, because I'm looking to expand and always looking to challenge myself. So that's the next move for me, is to take on these bigger projects. So I'm Christopher Senegal, real estate investor, developer based in Houston, Texas. I got into real estate in 2008, flipping houses. Around 2010, I realized I was actually accelerating gentrification in my own communities. And so I wanted to hit reset. I was whoa, 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 whoa. What do you mean? When you go into a neighborhood, you knock on doors, you ask people to sell their house, you, you offer them below market so that you can either go make a profit by selling it to another investor or you keep it yourself and then you renovate it and then you price it so high that nobody from your community that looks like you can afford to buy that house or rent that house. Oh, you are accelerated. You, are ex you accelerate it. You okay. accelerate it. Because a lot of us are taught from people that don't look like us. Mm -hmm. So they, they're teaching you how to make money, but they're not teaching you how to look out for your community. Mm. Right? So in 2010, 11, I, I hit reset. I, I liquidated my portfolio. I wanted to go and figure out how to do bigger, better projects. So I figured out a, a, a cheat code to buy blocks. So I've been buying blocks in 2013. The trick is to go find heirs of real estate investors who inherit whole portfolios with no debt or little debt. Most of these second generation people are silver spoon people. So they don't wanna do the work. You can go to them, negotiate owner finance terms, but you don't have to use a bank. You either bring the down payment money yourself or you bring other investors in, let them bring the down payment money. That's how you control contiguous blocks of property. So I own three blocks in Houston now. One of them I did new construction on to bring higher income black people back to the neighborhood. Mm. The second one, I did a million dollar crowdfund. We bought uh, 18 houses with residents that have been renting there, some of them for 30 years. I got two tenants that are sisters that have been living next door to each other for 20 years. Mm. Okay, now I bought that whole block, didn't have to raise anybody's rents because those vacant commercial spaces along the old business district that was the Black Wall Street that every city had, even though we talk about Black Wall Street in Tulsa all the time, every city had that before desegregation took those vacant buildings, put those back online, doubled the revenue from the project. Now I can leave my residence rent at $500 to $700 a month. I've doubled the revenue from the project. We bought it for 1.2, just appraised at 1.9. I let people invest as little as $250 in the crowdfund. We paid distributions out three times because it's already got base level rent. Mm. Next, level, next project, I bought a five acre church right across the street from a $2.4 billion development. Um, the church, most of our big black churches own some prime real estate in our communities. The way people worship has changed. Church membership goes down. These people either use their, lose their campuses or they get smart and they sell them. So I partnered with this, this black church. 
um, biggest mega church, first mega church built in 1947 in Fifth Ward, Houston, Texas. Uh, bought the property from them, cashed them out. They bought a smaller campus. They're renovating it now. Uh, but there's so much redevelopment going on in that community. I'm talking a lot. Uh, the value of the property, the land just went up $2 million on its own. So I bought it for 6.7 in December. We tried to work on that deal. Mm, um, y'all two together? Yeah, but I was I was very premature. Everything I do, I, I take big risks. Hold on, did y'all know that? Did y'all y'all know each other before? That's how I met him. That's how I met him. Word? So, can yeah. I say this thing about it real quick? Yeah, but can I be down because we're on a platform together? <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 value. I don't know how, but go ahead. I'm well, sorry. He came uh, to to me looking for financing, but his proposal, I mean, for a, a was that your first deal? My first deal last year. For like, I, I I get deals all the time. People hit me up, yo, I'm, you know, I need to get fund. His proposal was so meticulous, and it had all the information that I needed. And it was just, it was an artistic piece of art. I was so impressed. So before I even know him, I told them, you know, I was just impressed. Just you know, he's a real estate. Phenom, you know, just the way he put it together. He got the right people and he told the right story. And ultimately, if you tell the story, you get the money. The money is out there, but you have to be able to put the deal together and narrate it in such a fashion that people can be like, yo, that I'm going to put my money behind this guy. Because it's not the property, it's the person that's running the deal. You know, so that's that was insightful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you have more? No, I was gonna say like, so what I'm doing now is the apartment complex, because my goal now is every project I do, I displace zero people. So on this side, I'm not, I'm displacing no one. I'm a partner with the housing authority with the city. Half of it's gonna be market rate, because I want to bring higher income black people back to the community without displacing. That's how we get the grocery stores and everything else back to the neighborhood. And that's how you do it without displacement, because a lot of people don't want to own. Then we always talk about in our neighborhoods, we don't want to move back because of the education system. So I've, I've recruited and secured the largest uh, black owned charter school system in the country to be the anchor tenant for that development. Mm. So mm. now we control our own narrative. The founders, the lead usher at MLK's funeral, they own over $200 million worth of assets. They own all their real estate. Mm. Um, so it just, it's just, we, we've had independent millionaires since Madam C.J. Walker, right, right after uh, the emancipation of slavery. That ain't working for us. We gotta rebuild our communities. We gotta own them. This wealth vision has to be bigger than independent wealth. We have to re-own all these neighborhoods. I love it. <laughs> All right, so we got, we got to jump into it. And you said, you said something interesting that uh, I want to throw this to you, Eddie, because uh, in our episode, it's going to release soon. Uh, you said something about it, about um, how you were uh, working with black churches. And back in the day, the churches would buy buildings around the churches, mm -hmm. right? right? And then you've structured a bunch of deals, like especially in Atlanta, where you're doing it. Could you explain that to me? Sure. I mean, it's the oldest form of public-private partnership. A lot of developers create public-private partnerships with municipalities, development authorities. Hold on, hold on. public private, private partnerships. partnerships. This is a P three, you know, structure. And so, can you explain that though? So P three structure is where the private entity is able to create a partnership with the public entity, and so the public entity is able to bring in different subsidies to allow the deal to take place. Sometimes there's some gaps in the financing where you can't get your traditional financing to make the deal work. So the deal is pretty much infeasible. So if you're looking for you know, certain types of financing, you have to go to the municipality. Can, can you give and, me an example? So you might have to work with the city. You might have to work with the uh, development authority within that jurisdiction. You might have to work with the um, like their version of an Invest Atlanta. But give, which give, is, me, give me an example of like maybe a deal that you are in where the public and private entity work together. Like, just give me an example, just so I can see it visually. Sure, I could use Auburn Avenue, going back to what he said just a little bit ago about these um, faith-based organizations. So this public-private partnership is a partnership between um, us and We Street Charitable Foundation that is right on Auburn Avenue, which was a black Wall Street back in the day. One of the richest one mile and a half stretch of African-American owned businesses in the early 1900s. And then we did another deal with um, Bethel AME Church, which is literally uh, a few blocks away, um, west of the uh, Wheat Street you know, Tower. So that partnership, the way we structured it, as opposed to buying their properties away from them because of the fact that they're losing membership, they have higher debt, but they have real estate that they don't know how to redevelop. Okay, so most people want to come in and just buy their real estate and bring in, you know, higher priced 
apartments or condominiums or single family homes. So that creates the gentrification. As you know, Fourth Ward is really contiguous to that MLK historic district. So we were able to work with both of these um, churches and structure a way where we could actually create some liquidity for them by selling their property into a new partnership that we created that included them for long-term ownership. You sell their property into a new partnership. That we both own now. God. So it. not only did we create a liquidity event for them, you know, based on the sale of the property or a ground lease of the property, but also now they're a minority partner in the deal as a co-developer. Mm -hmm. So they participate in the co-developer fees, they participate in the cash flow. And from a residual standpoint, if there is an opportunity for us to sell it down the road, we won't because we want them to buy us out. So that way they retain ownership of their asset, of these new totally redeveloped assets for a long term. And they could use that on their balance sheet. But the other side of that public-private partnership was with the city and Invest Atlanta. We had some gaps in the financing. So we had to partner with them in order to get you know, certain um, bond funds that allowed for residential bond funds that they had uh, for housing opportunity in that area. We tapped into the tax allocation district, um, East Side TAD there to get some tax abatements that we're able to qualify for. So things of that sort, um, those are the things that you have to maneuver and get very creative from a financing standpoint in order to make deals like that come to fruition. Gotcha, gotcha. Did you know the S&P 500 was up over 26% in 2021? Now I'll probably speak in Spanish. But what it means is if you took $100 and put it into the stock market and invested in uh, some of the top 500 companies in America, that $100 that you invested in 2021 by the top of 2022 would have turned into $126. But you had your money in the bank and it lost money, actually, through depreciation, all kind of weird stuff. You want to invest, but you have no idea what to do. Let me introduce you to my sister and my coach, Terry Igioma. She's teaching me the stock market, OK? And I'm making money in the stock market. In fact, she has the number one course on the Teachable platform. Teachable has tens of thousands of courses on the platform. She has the number one course, but she cheated. I know why. The reason she's a better teacher is because she came from education. She was an, administ she was an administrator in elementary school teaching kids how to become profitable uh, members of society. So, of course, if she can teach kids, she can teach people like you and me. OK, so do yourself a favor. Go to TradeAndTravel.com. She's the best teacher in the world. She's my teacher helping me make money. And when, I'm, when you go to TradeAndTravel.com, she's giving away some free stuff. So just go to TradeAndTravel.com. This episode, this whole dinner is sponsored by Terry Igioma because she wants to help our people, empower our people to learn this side of money. All right. So go to TradeAndTravel.com. Let's get back to dinner. See, you do a lot of... Um... Like even like when we started talking about you know the the you know buying property and flipping property and, and developing land, you always talk about I'm developing communities for my people. Right. Um, is there a downside to that? Um, I mean, I think I think every single investor on this stage have you know amazing approaches to being able to help the community. Um, for me, I don't think that there's a down approach because what I do is I literally develop within that average income in that area because the city owns most of the land because it's adjudicated. What does adjudicated mean? Adjudicated means that people have gotten behind on their taxes and the city has now taken the property and or the county, whatever the case may be. Well, they own a ton of real estate. So I'm like, well, what if I create a land bank or something of the sort to be able to go back and buy back the entire community, develop it, build the homes that are affordable to the people in that actual community? I focus on 
the hearts and the minds of the people there because I know the average household income in Louisiana is about 200, not income, the average sales price is $250,000. Well, when you got people working at the hospitals and the cafeterias, you got the school teachers, you got all of these people that's making anywhere from, you know, 30 to $75,000, they don't really have a large quantity of properties to be able to go shop from. So I'm focused more on the 80% that's out there, not the 20%. And so um, I also have... Um, home education classes where I partner with the city for them to be able to come in and get um, funding options so they don't have to put down payments down. They just have to go learn how to keep their house because I think that that's very important as well. So for me, when I go and I look at a community and I'm like, all right, I want to develop this community, it needs to be large enough where it can impact the city, where it can be a catalyst for other abandoned communities in the area, such as the, like I wrote up Martin Luther King Care. Every city I go into, I go in Martin Luther King Road. I want to see what it looked like, right? Show me a city where Martin Luther King is thriving. Show me a city. That's what I'm focused on. It's time to thrive. Martin Luther King thrived for us. We have to thrive for him, right? So that's the type of um, stuff I focus on. So when you ask me, no, I don't think there's a downside to it. I love it. Thank you. Thank you. I, want to, I know a couple of you all talked about like your first property, but um, um, for those that didn't, I'd like to know how you got in the game. I know you said you bought one here in Atlanta, right? Just, just real quick, a bridge version, everybody. If you could remember the first deal, because there's some people that's going to be the, a person their first, first deal. I want to know how you found it and how you financed it. Okay, really, really quick. I was working in Atlanta at the time. And I needed a place to live, and I was, I, I was renting in Buckhead, needed a place to live, thought it was a great idea to just buy a place and have another tenant pay the mortgage. Simple as that. So that was my first deal. <laughs> How'd you get the money? How'd you finance it? It was FHA, right? Simple, 3.5% down. That property, I purchased that property for under, probably around $100,000. Got in 3.5% down. That property today is has gone up, you know, tremendously. But the point, and that was the only property I sold, and I regret it, right? The only I think property I sold. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the first yeah, one. The first one. The first one. You said that's the only property you ever sold. I've ever sold, right? Because I've learned, like since then, I was young. I was just getting into real estate, but I understand. I, I later went on to work at a family office, and I understood one of the key tenets of wealth building. And you have to have assets, right? The wealthy, they don't sell their assets. They hold on to it. They refinance. Mm -hmm. And when it comes time to pay the taxes on that, what they do, they defer, 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 die. And then they, <laughs> then they give those assets on and their heirs inherit the asset at a stepped up basis. Yeah. So the taxes they owned before wiped out and that cycle gets repeated. So that's what we need to do in our community because what happens in our community we inherit a house from grandma. House is owned free and clear. First thing they want to do is sell it. Get the money. Not knowing that if they keep that money in the family, you're building generational wealth. Absolutely. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Woo. No fix and flips, no nothing? I never did the fix and flips. Maybe because I'm not handy, right? <laughs> <laughs> so it, 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 it's asset accumulation. Gotcha, yeah. gotcha. He, he's going to haunt me in my dreams. So you know like the gangster movies when they're like when you shoot your first person no matter who you shoot after that you see the first face. Right. Okay that first house for me is the face. Right? <laughs> so he's like my assassin right now. I got my first house from my grandma. Um, um, she had a section eight house. She lived there for a long time. A lot of deferred maintenance. She passed away when I was 19 years old and um, they was like hey your name is on this piece of paper. What do you want to do? And I was like, what piece of paper? What do I do? So my first thought was, oh, yeah, I get to live somewhere for free. No more rent. Let's go. Then I walked in and realized it was not fit for a millennial. It did not have <laughs> recessed lights. <laughs> it was like still plastic on the couch. I said, crap, mom, I should have not been paying bills from a distance. I should have came over and saw you. Um, so I sold it. That was not the first thing that I wanted to do, though. I actually did want to fix it, but I completely lacked the education. I didn't know that there was equity in it. I didn't even realize I was in one of the highest, at the time, highest gentrification spaces in Philadelphia. Mm. I was in Point Breeze. I had no mm. idea. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't know the difference between an investor and an agent. I didn't know hard money. I didn't know credit. I didn't know FHA. Mm. I was a cashier at a supermarket. 
and I was tired. I was frustrated because I was trying to figure it all out. And a guy who lived next door, three-story rooftop deck, I'm not even putting the pieces together. Why does he live next to my grandma? And why does his house look like the rest of the houses? And why are these houses here? This was just like vacant land because they knocked down abandoned houses. My mom didn't go there at 19. Mm -hmm. But his mom was like, hey, you want me to introduce you to my realtor? Because your family is coming and ruining. Like they were throwing the trash in the backyard because I was the youngest. And I was under attack because they're like, why did she leave it to you? I'm like, why did you think? I'm like the best granddaughter ever. <laughs> if you're watching this, just know I'm like the best granddaughter ever. So long story short, I sit down with this agent. And he's like, yeah, we'll list it for 115 which was good for me because when contractors were coming to give me quotes, they all were like, this is way too much for you. Let me buy it. It's not worth any more than 60. But if you walk me to the truck, I'll give you outright debt free because it was a section eight property. So now you're thinking, oh, 115,000 in my Yeah, because the contractors was like 60 right now. I'll pull it out of my pocket. And I was like, well, this is more than what the contractors offer. So 115, let's do it. Um, within a week, we're at a bidding war. Never even crossed my mind. As much common sense as I have, this was like a blank space for me. Probably because all you could see is $115,000. At 19 like years old, 19. right? So 115, we're at a bidding war. Within a week, we're at 152000 Cash offer, take that one. I didn't even leave it, let it go to like day eight. Because <laughs> I didn't know. I was like, is this like how you hold them or fold them? Like, take that guy's money. So we did it. But I was determined to learn. So that one fifty two. I reinvested it. Like that one year I bought real estate. I went to real estate school and that's when I learned the difference between agent and investor. Um, the agent who helped me sell, he sent me down with a financial advisor like the moment we closed. And he said, hey, give me all of your money and we'll put it in a Roth IRA. I said, cool, what's that? It's something that we just keep until you're 65. I was like, oh, my grandma just died at 58. I don't think this is going to work for me. <laughs> Whoa, buddy, just met you yesterday. Like you know, they didn't even like warn me. So I said, you know, I don't think I want to do that. So they were looking like, well, what are you going to do? I said, I'll buy houses. One house got me this much money, I'll buy more. And like during my journey, I realized how much I didn't know. So the nice little agent set me up with another buddy. Now this buddy is selling houses because I told him if one house got me this much, I'm going to do that. So he found another little plug and play. He was going to get all his commission from me. Um, so now this guy is selling me properties as an investor. And some of them are really, really cheap. Like I purchased one for 6,500. I didn't even see it. Ooh. And I was like, if you can sell it for 65, what did you purchase it for? And he told me that I went to the auction and blah, 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 blah. And I was like, okay, these, all of the things that he named, I started to study and look up and progress. So now I'm going into year eight and that's how I got my properties. Wow, very good. <laughs> Moral of the story, don't sell grandma's house. Say it with me. Don't, don't sell, sell grandma's house. house. Because <laughs> when you go to buy it back, you have to buy it for $358,000. Even though you sold it. <laughs> Chris, That's first cool. property. All right, so my first property background, I was in corporate America. I hated it. I was like, I got to get my early exit plan. I looked at that 401k. I was in corporate America like two years, had a corporate match, had like 14,000 in it. I'm like, I'm gonna leverage this. I'm gonna pull this out. Like she said, they told you to leave it in there until you retire. I was like, nah, I wanna make some of this work for me now. Um, so 2008, when everybody was scared of real estate, it was the best time for an investor because there was so much inventory that nobody was buying. So my first house, uh, my line brother worked for home, home investors, the we buy ugly houses people. And uh, he brought me over there. They had a bunch of inventory. I picked out a house. He plugged me with one of the contractors that they were using to renovate all those, those their, their houses. That guy became my mentor, uh, picked the house, flipped it. That's how I did my first deal. I kept it as a rental for like eight years. And then when I liquidated everything, I sold that one too. And that's mm. how I got into it. What's it worth now? Uh, it's probably worth about uh, about 175. And I, when I, I bought it for 40, put about 45 into it, so I was 85 all in on it. How much did you sell it for? Uh, I sold it for 120, 125, something like that. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. yeah. Let me ask you, do you wish you would have kept it or that was a good move? No, for, no. for me, it was a good move because there's a certain point where you have, if you have, so she said she, she's debt free. I didn't go that route. So I had a bunch of loans. When I got rid of you own all your houses outright. No loans on them. Which is smart. But see, I didn't do that. So I had debt. I had a bunch of loans on a bunch of real estate. So then when you try to leverage up to go do bigger deals, the bank, the bank looks at you under a microscope. They're like, well, you got all these loans and you got these small margins. And if you're trying to borrow a million dollars from me, you look risky because you have so much debt on your balance sheet. So when I sold all that, that was specifically to clear my balance sheet so I didn't have any of that on there. So it was a strategic move for me. Gotcha. Yeah. Good, good, good. Eddie, first one, do you remember? First one, well, 
I'll answer it two ways for you because um, the first investment I made, I lived in it. So, um, because I needed a place to live. But I was 22 and I just graduated out of college and moved here to Atlanta. And I had planned on not renewing my lease in the apartment I was living in in Smyrna. I said, well, I need to buy a house, but my credit was bad. We lived in college, University of Florida, we we're having a good time, not necessarily uh, keeping up with the bill. So, it's like, well, how will I get financing? And it was like, it's gonna be pretty difficult. You have to put a pretty sizable down payment. And back then, 5% wasn't going to work where my credit score was. So I started saving my money that year and I ran into an opportunity to buy a house based on a program that existed back then in the early 90s. Uh, well, it started in the 80s, but it was about to sunset and it was called NENQ, non-escalating, non-qualifying loans. For most people in here, you probably were very young when, the, when those loans were out. And uh, it was a, an old teacher who lived in um, out east, a pretty nice house. I was able to buy it from her for $65,000. It was um, three name? bedrooms out in Lithonia and uh, three bedroom, two and a half bath, um, small lot, pretty nice, well-kept home. But I was able to buy her, her pay her her equity. So paid her close to about $10,000 that she had in equity at that time. And I assumed a loan. So my credit, even though I had pretty bad credit, that well, I was recovering you know, my credit at that time, but it wasn't strong enough to get a, a decent loan. And so I paid her cash, the $10,000, moved in and assumed her, her loan. Like a and subject to? I'm sorry. What'd you say? Like a subject to do. What'd you say? Subject to do. A subject to do. Like a subject to do? Yeah, kind of pretty much like that. Okay. And so back then they called it NENQ. And um, so that program doesn't exist, stopped existing, was, a, you know, around the, the 90s. And so I had one of my fraternity brothers that lived with me. And so he was paying rent. His portion of the rent covered my mortgage. Oh. And I was like, wow. And we were splitting the utilities. I was like, man, I might as well continue to save as if I were paying rent. Yeah. And so the money I saved, I was, I was able to um, save enough money to now move on some of the opportunities that came up from the condo conversions. So I don't know if anybody here really remembers in the mid nineties, a lot of the apartments were being converted into condos. And so I was able, I was working for corporate America also for a major developer at that time. And um, I had a lot of um, connections to some of those developers. I was able to get on the list of one of their preferred you know, investors, not with a lot of money. This is about who you know and being there at the right time and also presenting the right way. They didn't know I didn't have you know, strong credit. By that time, my credit was getting a little bit stronger. So when, when you actually put your name on, in, you know, in the hat to be an investor on one of those condo conversion deals, you, you lock in at a price. So let's just say you're buying a one bedroom, 750 square foot condo in Buckhead, like I've still owned today. Um, the price may have been at that time, say $110,000. By the time they get through the condo docs and they get all the approvals and they give the renters that are living there the first right of offer to buy, that price can go from $110,000 to about $125,000. By the time the conversion takes place and they renovate your unit, okay, and it's time for you to close on your unit, that one ten may go up to $130,000. Okay, or 135,000. So look at the equity that I built without doing anything, just because I'm just waiting on time. The developer's taking all the risk. So there's been situations. So that first one that I purchased is actually right behind Lenox Mall. It's called Lenox Heights. I still have it. And that, that is one of the units that's never stayed vacant. There are times that I don't even have enough time to actually recondition the unit for the next tenant to move in because they're like, is such a high demand. What do you think and it's worth right now? Today is definitely um, worth uh, probably about two fifty or so, but mm. you know it's paid off. And that's how real estate works. You it buy works. something, yes. it's always going to go up. Yes. It was, and so those those deals. So that deal started strengthening my credit even more, and I was creating you know more cash flow. So and these same developers were doing other deals. 
So I was immediately, you know, put on the preferred list. So I was able to get a great opportunity to invest in some of their other deals while they were taking, you know, most of the risk. So, so uh, I do got to uh, take time out. Speaking of helping the community, this episode is sponsored by Terry Igioma. Okay, I told her that I wanted to keep doing these events, but I was and I was cool like losing money doing it because uh, I want to make sure y'all ate and y'all hung out. Um, but she said I will sponsor the next year's. Uh, um, episode. So give her a round of applause. Yeah, yeah. 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 friends, man. Yeah. Yeah. Friends, bro. She's like literally the number one course creator on the Teachable platform out of like tens of thousands of people. Um, she teaches me how to trade and invest in uh, in stocks. For She trades everything. She is just an amazing, amazing teacher. So uh, this episode is sponsored by Terry Igioma. Okay. Listen, as you know, I am in Nehemiah Davis's inner circle. I talk about him all the time. Last year, I had the biggest year financially based on his teachings. Actually, we just ran a play. He helped me make $70,000 in one day. Listen, what he's doing right now is an upcoming digital masterclass teaching exactly what he taught me to have a seven-figure year. I'm telling you, I owe a lot of my success to this man because he just understands marketing in a whole nother way. But what he's doing is offering the things that I he taught me to you for free. He's doing a digital masterclass that he's given to you for free at General Admission, 50% off the VIP. I suggest VIP. Um, because you, you get a lot more time with him and he really pours into the VIP. But if you just want to go to the class and you want to be a part of it, general admission free. A lot of y'all have been following him, waiting for him to open something up. He's giving it exclusively to the podcast listeners, 50% off. So don't tell nobody, okay? So listen, go to spmasterclass.com, free general admission, 50% off VIP. Do VIP though, okay? spmasterclass.com. Go get it. Let's have a big year this year. First property, Terrica. Oh, mine's is very easy. I um, I had got my tax return. So but a little backstory. I was in a lot of debt, y'all. So like I would go from one payday loan place to the next, to the next, to the next as a real estate agent. And so I was like, all right, when I get my tax return, I'm going to do something different. Like I have to do something different. And so I got $5,000 back. And I was like, all right, I need to pay off everybody that's calling me and or I can try to find a property. Nobody told me I needed X, Y, Z. I didn't know any of that stuff. I just knew that I had $5,000 and I was going to find a property. So um, a bird dog, which is a um, wholesaler pretty much, right? Um, and or work for a wholesaler. Bird dog contacted me and was like, hey, we got this property. You know, um, we're asking about 9000 I said, would you take five? They said, yes. That's where you learned that, Terrica? Because I'm going to yes. ask another question. <laughs> Yo, Terrica, she just be offering, like, she offering whatever is in her head. That's right. Like, yeah. thinking about a percentage, I'm like, Terrica, that's yeah. half of what they want. She's like, well. Make oh, the bill. You can take it or leave it. That's right. Yeah. 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 Take it or leave that is actually going to be my next line of question. But go ahead. Yes. I'm <laughs> So um, he was like, yeah, we'll take it. So uh, um, I bought my first rental property for $5,000 and it was ugly. It was the ugliest house on the block. Somebody say, who has, who say it has to be pretty, right? Like it does not have to be all the bells and whistles with all the multiple doors. You just start where you are. That's what I did. And so um, I had a $3,000 um, real estate commission. And a lot of you guys don't know, but this house was remodeled by Dollar General. OK, what does that mean? Dollar General sell pill and stick flooring. I surely went and bought all of their flooring and I put it in Dollar that house. Dollar General sells so yes. pill and stick flooring. Pill and stick flooring. Yes. We worked this deal. And then I went to the bank and I told Carrie, who is my banker still to this, I said, look, I have horrible credit. It's like five something. I know you're going to check. I said, but I've brought a lot of clients to you over the years. I said, I just would like for you to take a chance on me. And he said, absolutely, sure. And he said, um, say no more. So I told him about the property. They went out, they appraised it. It appraised for $60,000. Mm. So, mm. um, so he gave me 80% of that value. I took that 48000 and I went and bought more doors. So my tax return is how I got started. And I still got that property. It runs me $550 every single month. And I love it. <laughs> Same got the same floors in there. <laughs> well, no, 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 no. We didn't upgrade it since then. Yeah. <laughs> we had to change them out. No more and how, how long was that? Two thousand twelve. Two thousand twelve. Still paying. Yeah, still paying. Do you own it free and clear? Um, yes. Now, at first, when I leveraged it, no. 
but I, wanna, I leveraged it to get to where I'm at. But now it's paid off completely. Gotcha. Because I want to ask about is like your strategy, or I don't know if it's a strategy, but own it free and clear. Is that something you advise people? But go ahead. Duh. Yep. So with me, a little backstory, right? So I went to an affluent uh, high school, cost about thirty-two thousand dollars a year. I wasn't one of the people that you know, our family wasn't rich or anything like that. High school cost you thirty-two thousand a year. Thirty-two thousand, but I was able to get a basketball financial aid scholarship for two thousand dollars a year. But what I learned was half the school was Jewish, right? And they had you know private yachts, they had uh, jets, limo service at bar and bat mitzvahs, getting the Range Rovers and so forth. So I really just got a chance to set back and just observe. And what I noticed was the commonality, no matter what the parents had going on, they all owned real estate. So either apartment buildings, beach houses, condos, they all owned real estate. So that really just peaked like a light bulb, literally went off in my head that, you know what? I need to own real estate. So I started reading books, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. My dad gave me the richest man in Babylon back when I was in seventh grade. So I say, you know what? I have to get real estate. So I went to college, finance degree, got hired by Bank of America for $50,000 a year. Rent it out for the first year, but I say, you know what? I got to own real estate. I have to own real estate. So I had a girlfriend at the time, but I, I got a FHA loan, 3.5% down on a quarter million dollar property. Brand new construction, four bedrooms, three and a half bath house. Right? So we, my, my girlfriend and I, we actually living in the main, bat, main bedroom. And I say, you know what? I don't want to pay for this house. She said, what do you mean you don't want to pay for the house? So I don't want to pay for this house. I want to rent these rooms out. So she was completely against it, didn't want a, a guy our age living in the property, didn't want a lady our age living in the property, you know, un understandable. <laughs> didn't want a, a creepy old man living in the property. So hands are tied behind my back, got a retired grandmother to live in one of the bedrooms for 750 bucks. Had two more bedrooms, so I asked her simply, do you want to um, rent out these other rooms? She said, absolutely not, it's right across the hall. So I said, you know, again, I don't want to pay for this property. I got half the mortgage paid, it was only $1,300. So I asked her, do you want to be rich or do you want to be poor? She said she was okay being poor. So I gave her the two-week okay notice. Okay being poor. Okay being poor. I, I, yeah, bye, bye, bye Felicia. <laughs> <laughs> if you're watching this, I, I'm sorry. You made a decision. But uh, <laughs> best part about it is I rented out those other two rooms, 650, 650. So now I'm living in the master bedroom. Trading like your girlfriend for money? Well, Yes. Opportunity. <laughs> opportunity. Opportunity. Yes. 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 Now you're getting that much closer to that freedom, to that mobility. So now if you don't want to work, if you, nothing wrong with working the nine to five, nothing wrong with clocking in, nothing wrong with hugging a cubicle till you're 67 and a half. But for any reason, if you don't want that, how can you go about lowering your overhead and living for free? So my biggest thing was the faster I could live for free, the faster I can get closer to making my escape route out of that nine to five, out of that corporate world and live life on my terms. What I've noticed from all of you is your first property, you just started where you were. Like it wasn't that you had to go find an investor to believe in you. It's you either got a house because I needed somewhere to live. I, you know, I had a job, so I went and got a, 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 a house or your grandmother left it to you. Anybody in a situation right now where you can't get any real estate, you can't start where you are. I don't, that, that was the most, that was the most um, impactful thing to me. I do want to ask y'all a question. When it, you guys are all investors, and I really do care what people think about me. So if somebody's going to sell something for $200,000, right, how do y'all decide what to offer? I don't even want to disrespect people at a lower price. Terrica says, well, offer what makes you feel good. I'm like, <laughs> No, you have to be offensively low. Like, if it doesn't hurt, then you offer too much. Like, if they're not offended, then you you offer them too much money. So, usually, people don't ask for what they want anyway. So, it's always, they go in with the intention to negotiate with you. You have to read the book called The Power of Negotiation. But if you go in and it's too good for them, then it's a bad deal for you. Because you have to have so many contingencies when purchasing a property. Well, how much is this going to cost for me to fix it up to actually be able to generate income? As an investor, we go in with one number. 
and we can be above or below like 20 percent right for guys who fix the properties you you see everything except what's behind the walls or what's under the floor or is it mold is it so you have to go in to protect yourself real estate is an investment but it's an investment in yourself first but also it's not personal so it's not a matter of trying to spare someone's feelings it's business so that's the first thing you have to look at number two the number has to make sense so whatever you offer you have to have a way to substantiate that based on what the market comparables are so just because you're asking a million dollars for a parcel of land but everything else around there over the past two to three years has been selling for about half a million dollars you may say wow Eddie, he's asking a million dollars you just offered 450 that's pretty low that's insulting no that's actually really the right number okay that person, he's asking a number, she's asking a number that is overinflated and cannot substantiate that number. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I just, I you know what? Uh, I want to add to that too, because I'm, I'm mixed on that. I hear everybody talking from a real strong investor perspective. It also depends on who you're buying it from and what their family situation is. So if it's a black family that doesn't have a lot of money, I'm not going to go in and lowball the offer. Because I you know. Overpay? That, no, I wouldn't overpay. No, I would, I would, I would you love your people. I'm just no, no, no. But yeah, I do. I do. It, it, it has to make sense on both sides, though. Right. It has to be a number where I'm happy, where I'm not wasting my time, and especially if it's a neighborhood where I know the values are going to go up anyway. So time is going to be my, invest, my my return on my investment. Um, but if it's like, you know, just another investor, then yeah, low ball. But in certain circumstances, I think we can't we can't run that same thing across the board. Mm. Uh, even when you have like seniors that are losing their homes and. The money that they make from that sale literally has to carry them till they die. Let's say they're 70. What if she lives to be 95? Mm -hmm. You gave her 45,000, you could have gave her 60. That could have been a whole nother two or three years of her carrying her own expenses. Do you right? charge rent though based on the you know what you bought it for and what you acquired it for? Because you have to, you I have guess to, if you got it for a lower number, even the person that you're gonna house mm -hmm. may be able to benefit from. So, so the most important part is what your use of that real estate is gonna be, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're planning to leave it like it is, then yeah, you have to offer a lower number that makes sense. If, you, if you're planning on doing some renovations and raising the rent, then you can pay a little bit more in total between the acquisition and the renovations because you know you're going to get your return on your investment that way. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. I, one, one, one more example. So the church that I bought, I bought it for, everybody thought I was crazy. I, the church would only sell it for full appraised value, $6.7 million. All I did was change paperwork and say it's no longer going to be a church. It's, it's, I just want a land value appreciation for an apartment complex. Appraisal came back at 8.6 million. Mm. See the difference? Because I knew what I was going to do with it. Now, for a church, six million, six million would have been astronomical. Yeah. But for land for a multifamily in that area, that was cheap. So it really depends on what your end use is. Yeah. I, I know for me, when looking at the numbers, I'm a numbers guy, right? So it's all about the numbers. I want to see how fast I can get my initial investment back. So that's one of the things I'm looking at. Then also, I like to, especially properties that I'm fixing up, buying undervalued. I followed a 65% rule to a T. So what that means is if the ARV is $200,000, yeah. I need uh, after repair value, I have to be at 65% from a purchase as well as construction standpoint, because that guarantees essentially that I'll be able to refinance at 75 to 80% of that value. So I can get my initial capital back and then some, then I could roll that into the next deal and keep growing my empire that way. So you're not going to buy a property. You're not gonna buy a property unless you can get it for 65% under the after repair value. So, so let's say, let's say, let's keep the numbers simple for everybody. So let's say it, the property is worth $100,000. I need to be all in from a purchase and construction standpoint at 65%, which is 65,000. So for instance, if that property needs $45,000 worth of construction, I could pay no more than $20,000 for that property, right? And I'm sticking exactly to those numbers because the moment I start going over and above, then that means that I'm not gonna, my money's gonna be trapped inside of that property. And I like keeping the velocity of money keep turning and picking up more assets. Because the more assets I pick up, the more cash flow that I have, then as that cash flow is growing, now we're getting closer to more freedom, more mobility. And I will say this too, Dave, right? So um, what you guys see today is a lot of inflation. And because you're basing numbers off of inflation when the market adjusts, you know, um, you don't want to be in a situation like the 1980s or the 2008 situation. And so for me, I do a full... And I'm sorry, can you explain? Because we all know, it. you know, 
it was a crash or but can you explain what so happened? it was so it was a recession right so the um individuals in the banking market can tell you interest rates went extremely high um people were losing their properties you know they overpaid for properties and um i see that a lot now like i um i read a story where someone paid a million dollars over x price and now all of the neighbors are now selling you know um for a much higher price when all the homes were just at seven hundred thousand dollars so for me when i'm looking at an investment especially in today's market because everybody's like oh my gosh you can't get anything in this market without overpaying well i'm still getting deals that i feel good about and i feel comfortable and they still fit in my formula because i'm sticking to the process i'm not letting an inflated market make me make my business decision so the other thing i tell david is this i'm investing in, um, into my generational legacy, not theirs, right? And so for me, if it's a little old lady who's in a really tough situation, I would just rather walk away than take a haircut on a deal for me. And I also think, you know, what we see is a lot of people overpaying right now. And when the market adjusts itself, as it always do, you know, um, I w- you know, investors such as ourselves are going to be right there, just like they were in the 80s. And it's going to be a chance and opportunity for you to pick up properties at the real value of what it is. So yeah. I run my numbers off of that. Let me, let me get Eddie real quick. Then I'm coming to you. Yes, I definitely echo what she's saying. And um, it can't be an emotional purchase. That's one of the first things you want to put aside in the real estate business, whether you're looking at... Um, Small portfolio, large portfolio, it's the same principle. The emotional side needs to go away. It has to make sense. Also, your exit strategy is very critical as to how you enter the deal. You need to understand if you're looking at a long-term hold, which in our company, we hold our assets for a long period of time. Not only just because we want to grow them, but typically the deals we're doing, we're looking at a, a return on investment that we couldn't get somewhere else. So if I sell it now, so soon then I have to take that profit and go figure out how to replace it with another deal. And plus we're vertically integrated. So we have property management, construction management. So there's complementary services that work within our portfolio. But that exit strategy has to be understood. So if you're looking at buying and holding for a short period of time, like he just said, he has a strict rule, 65%. That's, that's his business strategy. So it doesn't matter whether you're 85 selling a home, which you shouldn't be by yourself in the first place, or whether you, you're filthy rich and you're selling the home. If, his, if, if it's $100,000 is what it's going to be worth after the repair is completed, as he talked about the ARV, the, you know, the, the uh, after repair value, he can't get more than that in the market. Maybe stretch it to 110, but he's not going to be that optimistic because he still has to pay commissions on the sale. So therefore, he won't, or if he's going to keep it, he's going to, refin- he's going to refinance and pull his equity out, hopefully some profit so he can buy something else. So he can't look at a home that's worth $20,000 and say, well, you know, depending on who he's looking at and say, well, I'll pay you 40, you know, you know, no. Like you just said, just walk away. The moment you feel as though your emotion comes in at play, then you're no longer doing business. Mm-hmm. Listen, if I was going to teach you how to make a million dollars, would you give me 10000 Like if I had a course teach you how to make a million dollars and you're po- positive, you're going to make a million dollars, would you give me 10000 Of course you would. It's no brainer, right? So in a calendar year, we make seven figures with the podcast. But there's 21 things that I extracted from that that you're going to need to launch a podcast. But I only got time to give you three right now. One is you need a distribution platform. The distribution platform is what you upload your podcast to. That platform sends it to Spotify, Apple, Google Play, so that your supporters can actually listen to your podcast. You're also going to need a microphone. You need a really good microphone so it's crispy audio. And three, you need an income strategy. This is not necessarily a hobby, unless you're going to make it a hobby. But I can teach you how I made the seven figures with these 21 things. Now, the good news is you don't have to give me 10,000. My ebook is only 37 bucks, okay? So listen, go to podcastebook.com and get the 21 things that you need. And I I can explain it in detail, all the things that you need, okay? Podcastebook.com. Let's get to the episode. Yeah, I was pretty much going to echo what she said, but, you know, just to back up and look at it and, and maybe really for you so you can understand why it's so important to get into real estate. And if not real estate, some other asset. The, the main reason why is because I'm sure you have enough money to buy a house. Probably have that money sitting in a bank account somewhere. 
But if your money is sitting in a bank account, you're actually devaluing the money, right? So what happens when you basically print money, just like the Fred, Fed is doing right now, year after year? We know what we're doing because you, you can go to the Fed website and you can see they could be talking, tapering what they're doing right now. They're saying they're going to taper, but they're not tapering. They're just printing more and more money, right? So when you have a deflationary event such as COVID, tell people they can't leave their house, tell people they, they can work from home and we're going to send you money and you put more money into the system, what happens to real estate? People go buy houses. When they buy those houses, the property value goes up, right? So understand what's happening. If you have cash, if you're holding on to cash, you're losing money. Whereas if you have real estate, the, there's more and more people looking to buy houses, the value of the real estate goes up. Not only does the value of the real estate goes up, but everyone on here own, is an owner, right? So every single year, rents go up. I had a property that I was charging a tenant $1,500 in rent. Today, because it's close to New York City, I'm getting $4,500 in rent in the space of like 10 years, but I've raised the rent to what the market is offering, right? Not, you know, enough respect to Chris. I understand your people, but I, I take the emotion out of it. You know, I pay what the market, like I'm not gonna charge my people three thousand dollars rent when the market's paying forty five hundred dollars. Yeah. I mean, I mean, this is because business, if you right? bend you know your break, saying? that's what they say. It's a saying. Once you bend your break, because then you just keep doing it. You move around. You're feeling obligated, but that doesn't create the change or structure that our people need sometimes. So, like, I, I heavily educate. I teach all the time. I do welfare to work seminars. Like, I teach. If they don't learn how to survive in our market, although I won't take advantage of them, somebody else will. Like, I can't save an entire community without educating them and teaching them, hey, listen, I'm going to give you this amount of money, but this is what you do with this amount of money. Because I had a little old lady, the deal was too good to walk away, right? So what I did was I said, okay, let's do a subject two. I'll get it from you. I'll pull equity. We'll be able to fix it up. I'll move you to Atlanta. That's where she wanted to go. And through the duration of her looking and stuff, I just paid her rent. Like I, I paced her through it. And then I used the insurance policy to purchase the whole thing out. So my debt free thing is uh, just with infinite banking. So like I, I do debt, I just owe myself. I owe my 45 year old self a few million right now, but she's okay because 28 year old her is here. <laughs> we're doing we're doing well. So she'll be she'll be fine. Um, but it, it just makes a lot of sense. It is very deal specific and you you have to have a strategy like so for my rentals, purchasing them in cash is okay for me because I use things like transitional housing to supplement the standard rent. So where he says like 45 hundred dollars a month, that's great, but transitional housing, they'll pay you twenty five thousand per person per room. The latest hotel deal that so there's two hotels. One that's like giving me hell in Atlantic City right now, but there's another one up closer to where I live. And the PPP structure, I didn't even know that that was a thing. I'm just very charming and educated. So I went to the councilman's office and said, hey listen, this hotel is bankrupt. And I only knew that because a lady who was at the kids' school during the parade was a property manager. And she was like, yeah, this old guy, he's not making enough money to pay me. Nah, 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 nah. I was like, oh, he's having money problems. I have a money solution. <laughs> um, but I took that to the city councilman office and I said, hey, listen, you have homeless people, right? Well, let's work out an initiative. I want this hotel. I don't want to pay for this in cash, obviously. But if you can grant me the government contracts and make me the source of housing for these people, then we can work something out. So that was like, damn, they're getting a hotel for free. Mm. And they were with it because I'm fronting the work. You know, obviously I had to make sure the paperwork was done and you have to get the license and the inspections. And there was a few fire escapes that needed to be put into place because of the amount of individuals there. But when you think about a hundred rooms, Right, because I didn't know he was talking about doors. I just was naming the buildings. But if you're talking about 100 rooms, max occupancy, you're getting 25,000 a month. Well, that's more than retirement. That's legacy. That's like generational, generational wealth. Because I wasn't silver spoon. It was a little brass, but I'm polishing that thing because I got <laughs> kids now. And once you start to put these things in place, because you got to understand these are things that has always been happening around us. Like it's not new. So when I was coming in young and I'm learning. Like I, I, the guy, I bought the house sight unseen just because I wanted to spend the money and not waste it. He said auction. I never looked back. Doug can attest. We're from Philadelphia. It was about a three year period that you couldn't hear my name without sheriff's cell. Like you, there was no way, like it was no longer the Philadelphia sheriff's cell. It was my <laughs> sheriff's cell. And I was taking our people to the sheriff's cells. And although I had money at the time, 
I was teaching them in a way to start from where they are. So no, you couldn't afford to go in and buy a house, but you can afford the deposit, right? You go to auctions, they want 10% down. So our goal number is now just for you to have 10% down on something. Now at the time, the opening bid was 1500 and the minimum you could put down was 600 You bring me $600, we're not gonna bid on anything past 6000 okay? You have 30 days to pay that balance. The 6000 minus the 600 that's 54 We're gonna sell it for anything over 54 to make your profit. We're gonna come out and sell it for 20 because it's still a house, mm -hmm. right? And then you, know, you take off the 54 from the top because that's what you owe. And the rest of that is your profit to reinvest. Now you can afford to do it. So you just have to look at where you can get in. The auction closed down. Now I'm doing pre-foreclosure. It's COVID, right? So all of these people are kind of on hold, right? They have the moratorium and they're like, yeah, I don't have to pay. Yet now, and when they do ask for their money, they're going to ask for it probably in a lump sum, or you're not going to be able to refi because you, you did some type of paperwork that says, I can't afford to pay right now. Oh, you couldn't pay me last year. Now you want me to trust you with my money. So I'm teaching them how to operate around the system in a way where it's conducive to their current lifestyle and what they can afford in that moment. How old are you? 28. Right. <laughs> sure. okay, one, one more before we go to the This, the, okay, it's 2022 right now. What is happening? Because we talked about like, it seems like everybody that buys a property, they're bidding over because they don't want to lose it. What is happening right now in this world of real estate? Because some people, I mean, I'm kind of nervous to get into real estate, unless it's, unless I'm with Terrica. Okay. You know what I mean? She's going to offer. She's going to offer what supposed to offer. But like, I, and it, we're nervous to buy properties because I feel like, all right, you're going to pay $100,000 over what they're asking. What if something happens and now you're like underwater? So where are we at in this real estate space? Just if anybody had a crystal crystal ball or some sort of prediction. I, I could tell you exactly. Based on the figures, what's happening is all over the country, you're seeing delinquencies rise, right? We coming into COVID, we thought the property values would fall. But what the banks did was said, we're not going to foreclose, right? And what you did was you limit the supply. Once you limit the supply, demand stays the same prices go up, right? So that's what's happening. So you're seeing properties going for a lot more over, people are paying over market because there's a limited amount of supply that's on the market. So that's the state that we live in right now. So what I've done is just say, look, I refuse to uh, purchase, I, I refuse to pay market value for any property. So you have to look to alternative means such as tax going into tax auctions, how what this alternative, wherever wherever the masses are going, if you really want to get those deals, you have to go the opposite direction because it's just too much people competing for a small pie, right? Mm -hmm. So that's really the, the the way to accumulate properties right now is going the opposite of where everyone else is in and, and refusing to pay market value for your property. Right? And, and you should always do that. I mean if you don't open a shoe store, you're not gonna go buy your shoes from Foot Locker. Mm -hmm. Right? Sure. Because you want you want to buy under market. Where, what you're talking about is, is retail sales, right? But like they were saying, we're still going to be looking for deals off market all the time. That's what we should be looking as an investor. And I know, I know back when, uh, after the recession, when I bought a lot of properties for 50 cents on a dollar, I went to a site called homepath.com. So, you know, a year ago, there's no inventory on there. But now I'm starting to see more and more inventory on homepath. Write that down if you guys didn't what get it. What is homepath? Homepath.com is a Fannie Mae. Uh, all the foreclosed properties, so from a single family all the, all the way up to a four unit no building. Commercial. <laughs> right. no, no commercial. Yeah. So so you can go right so you can go right there. Literally in every single area, every single part of the country, homepath.com, type in what you're looking for. And I literally picked up things for pennies on a dollar. And I started just What's picking the type them up. of person that's putting stuff on HomePath? So HomePath are foreclosed properties that have been taken back to the for, uh, so the bank owns them now. And, and to add on with that too, you get a 10 day hold if you're an owner occupant. So an owner occupant has an advantage going to home path, whereas if you're an investor, it opens up after the 10 day period. But it, 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 he's 100% right. And you better not lie, excellent. if you are an investor, because they will come yeah, and get you, it's like a $250,000 fine yeah. or half a million. I don't know if it went up or not, but you don't bid during that window if you're an investor and lie and say you are a homeowner, because they will come for you. And the, and the nice part about it is a lot of these homes are already livable because literally the family was just living in there. They got, you know, fortunately kicked out. So you can actually pick up properties that might just need a little paint and get it right back on the, the rental market and start collecting cash flow almost immediately. 
Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Do we see what happens after a situation like this where everybody's overpaying, lower supply, more demand, or demand staying the same but lower supply? What happens after this? And the, nobody can the, know. The, 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 buy, the, the buy and hold investor wins all day because everybody everybody that's losing their home that, that they had a mortgage, they're now becoming a renter. Most of them don't want to downgrade their standard of living, so they're going to go rent a house similar or just below where they were. So if you own a whole bunch of real estate as an investor, you're going to win. Well, you're going to see some equity erosion too. So for those, those if you're looking from a residential standpoint, if you bought your house for $200,000, but today that same house somebody's paying two fifty dollars for it, and you'll see some foreclosures you know, take place, you might still be hovering somewhere around after you know, this correction takes place, maybe your house is worth still 200,000 or 195, but you're not looking to sell because you, you know, you get the benefits, your, you know, your interest write-offs and whatnot. But those who purchase at 250 and 260, they just lost all this equity. They can't refinance. And either they just stick it out until the values exceed that 250. So you in your place, you're sitting there. So you just, you know, after three, four, five years, your values went up. And so you built more equity in your home, but they're just really just getting to par level. Yeah, the one thing I like about real estate, especially being a buy and hold investor, is the fact that you can make money in an up market, down market, sideways market. So let's say, for instance, the economy goes down for whatever reason, you could lower your rents, still cover the mortgage, still have smaller cash flow or things going up, increase your rents. I know I specialize in providing affordable housing, right? So at the affordable housing, let's say, for instance, my rents are at $1,400 and I have Section 8 tenants, so paid by the government. But let's say for any reason, person paying $3,000 in the same market, stuff's hit the fan and they're like, man, I can't afford this. My units are so nice with the quartz countertop stainless steel appliances, but that person paying $3,000 will be glad to come down to my unit and pay $1,900. So I'm still winning even in the down economy and they're still getting the amenities that they're used to at $3,000. And I'll say this too, you know, um, it's one of my favorite quotes, which is the transfer of wealth is from the impatient to the patient. And um, simply, That's a bar. yeah. <laughs> the, tra- the transfer of wealth is from the impatient, impatient to, to the, the patient. patient. That's Warren Buffett. Yeah. And so, what I would say is that, um, and I echo what everybody on the stage is saying right now, is that in this market, you see people that are obviously overpaying and doing everything. But the the key to real estate is it always readjusts itself. Like it always readjusts itself. And if you look at history and you'd be like, David, you always say, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? Well, if we look at history, we see that interest rates are going to go up. They're already going up. Right. And we see um, just like he was talking about with the foreclosures and different things like that. And so I just think it's extremely important to echo. Don't overpay for anything just because everybody else is doing it. In my community, um, I reject contracts. If I'm asking um, $190,000 for a house in my community, and they come at me with 200 to 220 to 230, I reject their contracts. I take the I take the price that I want, not because I'm here for money, but because I know that I don't want one of my communities that I develop to be one of a, a bankruptcy community where everybody's foreclosed and now I got all these abandoned houses and my son name on the street sign. So you think I want to go and look at that? No. So for me, I reject those offers and say, look, I'll take your offer at what I'm asking. I'm already making money. I'm good. I'm making money. So let's just make this, you know, make sense for both of us. Yeah. <laughs> look, y'all, we got, we're going to take a break. We're going to uh, grab something to eat. Um, uh, Oh, real quick. Yes, this episode is sponsored by Terry Igioma. Make sure you follow her. Name is somewhere right here. If you want to learn how to trade, if you want to learn how to trade and travel and live a travel a travel lifestyle where you can still make money and just hang out and enjoy the fruits of your labor, go down to the website here, tradeandtravel.com, I believe. Make sure you like and subscribe to this channel. Are all of y'all subscribed to the Social Proof Podcast? I'm going to come around and check your phones, okay? <laughs> Subscribe to the Social Proof Podcast, and we'll be back with episode two in just a second. All right? We're out of here. You are talented, but the biggest problem you have is you do not have a community. If you take your talents and put it in the right community, it will grow. It's like 
you have a really special seed. If you put it in the right environment, the right soil, it grows. When it's in the wrong soil, it just doesn't grow. You are a very special seed, but you're just in the wrong soil. You're around the wrong people. Do you know at the morning meetup, themorningmeetup.com, there's five to 700 entrepreneurs together every single day. The ground is fertile. I'm teaching entrepreneurship from very basic practical steps on how to grow your business. Inside the morning meetup, we've had multiple people. I've helped dozens of people quit their job. First off, I'm the best coach in the world. So I want you to join the community. Not for me though, even though I'm going to give you some really good information. I want you to be around this environment of other people that are winning. Okay. So go to themorningmeetup.com and just do the dollar trial. If you like it, you can stay. It's only $79 a month. I just want you to taste test it. But if you don't, if you do taste test it, you're like, oh, I don't like this. I don't like David. I don't like the way he looks. It's too early in the morning. It's actually 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. You can just leave. No obligation. It's all good. Nobody's going to chase you down. Okay? So go to themorningmeetup.com. This is exactly what you've been looking for.